Welcome to Who's That Pokemon, the most in-depth Pokemon anime rewatch podcast on the entire internet. If you didn't know, this is a retrospective look back on the Pokemon anime series episode by episode from the very beginning. The show has been airing for over 20 years now and has over a thousand episodes, yet it seems to get neglected by Pokemon fans, so I thought it was about time I got a podcast entirely dedicated to it. The first episode we're looking at today is the 29th episode of the Indigo League series titled The Punchy Pokemon. The Japanese title is Fighting Pokemon The Great Battle. This episode first aired in Japan on October 14, 1997, and in the United States on October 15, 1998. We've already covered this day in Pokemon history for the Japanese air date pretty recently, but on this day in Pokemon history for the American air date, in 2000, Gold and Silver were released in the US, and I had a big, big talk about Gold, Silver and Crystal the other episode, I think it was last episode, maybe two episodes ago, but yeah, I'm probably, I'm going to be repeating myself if I go over it already, so yeah, it's just nice to know that Gold and Silver have been released in the US. The IMDB rating for this episode is a 7.4, and the screenplay is written by Hideki Sonoda. This is his sixth episode of the show, and he last wrote Pokemon Sensation. The director is Toshiaki Suzuki. This is also his sixth episode in charge, which gives him the equal most episodes directed to date. He last directed The Tower of Terror. We have no major human character debuts here, but we do have a bunch of Pokemon debuts. We get the debut of Poliwrath, Machop, Machoke, Machamp, Hitmonlee, and Hitmonchan. And so there's a little bit of trivia to go along with this. All of the Generation 1 fighting type Pokemon appear in this episode, except for Mankey, who had obviously evolved previously into Primeape, so it kind of counts there. It's actually, yeah, pretty interesting that they featured every single fighting type Pokemon, and also illustrates just how poor the type distribution was in Generation 1, which is something I pointed out in my Pokemon Red and Blue review, that some types just get absolutely no Pokemon, and then other types like Poison or Water, they're just an absolute abundance of them in Generation 1. The Who's That Pokemon for this episode is Hitmonchan. But with all of that said, it's time to jump into our episode summary and discussion. This episode kicks off with a Hitmonchan running along the road, suddenly stopping by a tree to punch the air, while a girl watches the fighting type from behind. Ash and his friends are amazed, but believe Hitmonchan is a wild Pokemon. Ash tells Pikachu that if he can defeat Hitmonchan, he'll be a world champion Pokemon. When Pikachu doubts itself, Ash says that he will teach Pikachu his secret punch, prompting Misty and Brock to question when Ash became a boxing expert. So the location we see Hitmonchan running along, it does kind of look like where Ash was when he caught Primeape. It kind of does back up that this episode takes place in Saladon City. I also thought that while Hitmonchan is obviously not wild here, that they do speak of it as if it's wild at first. And it just made me think that how weird is it that something like Hitmonchan could just be a wild Pokemon running around like in, in the outdoors, just like living off the land, I guess. Because it's basically just a human that doesn't talk. It's literally wearing boxing gloves. So it's, yeah, it's just a real weird thought to imagine that just living, living life on the outside. There's also another example of people in the show shaming Ash unfairly. This one's not kind of in the show. It's from the narrator, so it's not really in the show, but it is in the show. It's not part of Ash's actual world. The narrator says Ash hasn't caught any Pokemon lately, when he literally caught Primeape like four episodes ago. So chill the fuck out, my guy. He's doing his best. He caught a dope Pokemon that he gave away for some reason. Well, he's going to give away for some reason. Come on, give him a break. I'm also not sure at all why Ash thinks a boxing match with a boxing Pokemon is a good idea. Like, why not just use your ranged attacks? You could definitely dominate with that. Pikachu can use its electric attacks from a great distance, which would be a huge, huge advantage against something like a Hitmonchan. So, I don't know, Ash is really just not thinking it through there. There is a little bit of trivia in regards to this boxing section. Ash actually wanted to teach Pikachu, or when he wants to teach Pikachu boxing, he says, Ashida no Tame ni one, for the sake of tomorrow number one. This is a clear reference to the 1970 boxing anime Ashida no Joe. For the sake of tomorrow number one, two are boxing lessons in the anime, so it's not something I've actually ever heard of, but according to Bulbapedia, that's a direct reference. Ash challenges Hitmonchan, but Hitmonchan blocks Pikachu's efforts. Pikachu sends an improvised rocket punch into Hitmonchan's face, but it's unaffected. A man runs over and tells Hitmonchan to not let its guard down, then tells him to knock Pikachu out, which it does. Suddenly, the girl runs out from behind the tree. She calls the man her father and begs him to come home and to give up trying to become a trainer. The man tells his daughter, Rebecca, 
that he won't quit until he becomes the P1 Grand Prix champion. He then informs everyone that he'll be at his gym and leaves. At the Fighting Spirit gym, Rebecca informs Ash and his friends about her father's ambitions and that he has since abandoned his family. After Rebecca's pleas, Brock volunteers his and Ash's assistance, saying that Geodude and Primeape will defeat Anthony and his Hitmonchan. What are you talking about? Uh, you don't mean Primeape, do you? Yeah, Primeape should be able to do the job. And I've got Geodude. We'll both enter the tournament and defeat that Hitmonchan. So the way Anthony refers to him being in the gym, it kind of makes you feel like Ash is going to be battling for another badge here, especially if you hadn't played the games up until this point. Or maybe if you had even had played the games up until this point and you were just a kid, you might not really realise that Anthony is not a gym leader. Or you might just be naive enough to believe that the anime would introduce its own like exclusive gym leaders. But yeah, he just refers to like he'll be at the gym. And to this point, gym has only meant, like, Pokemon gym, where you get a gym badge, so it could be a little bit confusing. I also really dig that his gym is just a rundown gas station that he's kind of converted. I think it's, yeah, it's just a nice little design touch that I really enjoyed. They also make a really big deal out of the fact that only fighting-type Pokemon can enter the P1 tournament. But then Brock immediately after this says he'll use Geodude. And I know it's mentioned on Bulbapedia that in the TCG... Uh, Bob, uh, Bulbasaur, <laughs> Geodude is classified as a fighting type because they didn't have ground type or something, or rock type, That's, uh, I don't know, I'm not an expert in the TCG at all, but yeah, Geodude's classified as a fighting type, so they kind of lumped it in with that, but I don't know if that is necessarily why they had him pick it, I think they just did it because, I mean, they needed something for Brock to put in there and he didn't have anything better. So got a little bit of trivia about both Anthony and Rebecca here. First up, Anthony is voiced by Maddie Blaustein. She's obviously still yet to take over as Meowth. It's coming very soon, the next handful of episodes, but she's become a frequent character of the day voice. So you can see how the team at Four Kids really do like her, and obviously they're going to choose her to take over as Meowth. Also, Anthony's Japanese name, and kind of his English name, is a reference to the professional Japanese wrestler Antonio Inoki who, if you're a wrestling fan, you probably know that name. He's a legend of Japanese wrestling. He's just a legend of wrestling in general, to be honest. He f he wrestled basically anyone who was anyone back in the 80s. I don't know if he really wrestled into the 90s, like, seriously. I think he was still going until surprisingly recently, I think. But yeah, he wrestled Hulk Hogan. He even had a fight against Muhammad Ali. So... Yeah, he was a big, big deal, and this is obviously a reference to him. There's a lot of sort of wrestling sort of stuff going on here, and yeah, they referenced or shouted out Antonio Inoki. Rebecca, on the other hand, is voiced by Annie Pondell, also known by her real name of Roxanne Beck. She had previously voiced Giselle and is the voice of Brock's Vulpix. She voiced Diana in the fourth Pokemon film, which was pretty much the biggest role she ever had. I guess, I guess Giselle is like kind of... A, a big character but I'd say voicing a character in the movie is probably a bigger deal especially because that was one of the films released in cinemas it was a, a limited run but it's still a legit theatrical film she would eventually leave the show in the fifth season finally a little dub edit here Rebecca's mother was never mentioned in the Japanese version so meanwhile Tim Rocket gets wind of the Grand Prix as well and decides to enter James and Meowth want to win for the all-you-can-eat buffet, but Jesse intends to go to the salon and embark on a shopping spree. However, James points out that only fighting-type Pokemon can enter, but Jesse says that they'll just have to borrow one, pointing to a tall man and his Hitmonlee, which James identifies as the Kicking Fiend. As the P1 begins, Team Rocket have since stolen the man's Hitmonlee in clothes, keeping him tied up and locked in a closet. So we get an unnecessary Jesse bikini shot when she's sort of daydreaming about what they can do with their winnings from the tournament. It's just... Whew. Don't really know why that was necessary, but I'm sure they got some young kids going back in the day, though. Also, now that we've actually arrived at the P1 in the episode, I can confirm that it does take place in Celadon City, at least according to Game Freak. I saw the image from their website. It was actually very easy to find. It's literally like the, the like I guess, profile image, you would call it, on the Bulbapedia page for P1. So... Yeah, it was a lot easier than I thought it would be last episode. But yeah, it, 
it says that it takes place in Celadon, so like nothing else can contradicts it. They literally don't mention where they are at all in the episode, so I guess they're back in Celadon. And and like I said, the road in the opening scene really does look quite similar, like the environment, to the road that they're on when they catch Primeape. So I guess it, it kind of lines up. However, on the contrary, the Pokemon.com description for this episode states the tournament is held in the outskirts of Fuchsia City. So and you've got two pretty official sources saying two different things. Neither of them are the actual sort of word of God from the show because, I mean, the Game Freak doing stuff like a poster like this for the show is kind of weird. Like, I wouldn't expect them to be doing that, but apparently they did. And Pokemon.com, they often get things wrong and they're not really, in a, you know, a completely reliable source. So who knows, really? The P1 is also brought up one more time in an episode. It's actually referenced in a Tyrogue full of trouble. Similar to Anthony's name being a reference, Giant's Japanese and English names are actually a reference to the professional Japanese wrestler Giant Baba who was a massive deal. He was a giant deal, you could say, in Japan. He was one of, like, the stars. He was absolutely beloved. And, yeah, this seems definitely seems like a reference to him, not only by the giant name, but Giant Baba was quite literally giant. He was so freaking tall. And, I mean, it, it's a pretty direct reference here. They're clearly going all in on the wrestling references. Which also leads me to believe that the P1 is actually just a big reference to New Japan Pro Wrestling's G1 Climax Tournament. It first went by the G1 name in 1991, I believe, which, like, the tournament kind of, that format existed for quite a while, but then they named it the G1 around the early 90s. So it, it would fit that the P1 is referencing the G1. And obviously the Antonio Inoki and Giant Baba direct wrestling references sort of confirms it in my eyes, which I, I really dig. Even the arena that the P1 is held in kind of looks like the Tokyo Dome, where New Japan has basically always held their biggest events. So, it's just really... I just, yeah, I just feel like this episode is one big wrestling reference, which just appeals directly to me, someone who is a massive wrestling nerd. I really do want to know how Team Rocket overpowered this gigantic man, though. He is truly huge, and somehow Team Rocket were able to just overpower him. I guess maybe they got the jump on him, like, that would make a lot of sense. But still, like, he's huge. He is, like, probably twice the size of any character we have ever seen, to be honest. So at the P1 Grand Prix, all the competitors are presented to the crowd. The first battle is between a Machop and Ash's Primeape. Despite Ash's pleas, Primeape refuses to listen until Machop launches a seismic toss and sends Primeape out of the ring. Ash rushes to save it, but misses. He then asks his Pokemon if it's okay. Primeape gives Ash a sad look, then shakes it off and jumps back into the ring. Now listening to Ash, Primeape is able to take control and defeat the Machop with Scratch and Mega Kick. But now it's taking orders from Ash. Primate, Scratch attack! Primate! 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 Attack! Mega Kick right now! I did find it really funny that the only, like, only the important characters that are in the P1 get an introduction. Everyone else is just seemingly a jobber and not worthy of a introduction whatsoever, even though there are, like, double the amount of competitors that are actually competing here compared to what's introduced. Also, when Ash flips out his Pokedex to sort of look up what's the go with Machop and it's what's its special move, its image is weirdly squashed in the Pokedex. It's the first time I've kind of noticed this, but... Yeah, it's really sort of like condensed in and smushed. It, yeah, it was really, really distracting. I think a lot of people have probably n noticed this over the years, but Primeape's character arc is like an extremely condensed version of Charizard's character arc. It's, ba it's literally condensed down to two episodes, which makes me wonder whether they saw this and they were like, that's a good idea. Maybe we should properly like expand on it. Because the Charizard storyline really does play out the same way. It stops listening to him. It's a real struggle. Ash has to try and get it to trust him. And then eventually Charizard trusts him. And it, it takes a long time. And it's actually a really well-developed story. Whereas here, Ash catches Primeape. Primeape 
doesn't like him apparently for like five seconds, but then it gets thrown out the ring and then it, it listens to him. It's just, yeah, really, really abrupt. So the next match is Hitmon Lee against Geodude. Brock waves to Rebecca saying everything is under control. Suddenly, Rebecca tells him to look out and Brock is hit in the head with his own Pokemon. He sends Geodude back into the ring where it's kicked mercilessly. Anthony approaches, telling Brock that a real man knows when to admit defeat. Brock throws in the towel and apologizes to Geodude for making a battle, and Team Rocket moves on to the next round. Ash promises that he and Primate will take care of the, to the tournament from that point forward. I also forgot to mention that Anthony wears a red tail around his neck all the time, which is literally like that's what Antonio Inoki does, so it's 100% a direct reference. And also, as you heard through my recap there, Brock gets absolutely clowned on by Team Rocket. Like, he literally doesn't stand a single chance. And honestly, Brock and Misty both come across as pathetic trainers. I've sort of talked about this before. But how are they ever gym leaders? They never show them as people who are competent battlers. Especially here, Brock just comes off as absolutely awful. So how did they ever land their positions if they can't, can't seemingly ever win, win like just simple battles? As more battles take place throughout the tournament, a trainer and their Machoke who defeated a Polyrath, the Prime Ape, Hitmonchan and Hitmonlee rise to the top of the ladder. The next main match is between Hitmonchan and Hitmonlee. Jesse is ready for anything and to make sure they win. Hitmonchan ends up stepping on glue which is part of a scheme from Meowth and it gets stuck. Anthony's Hitmonchan takes several mega kicks and Rebecca attempts to stop the match. This forces Anthony to intervene and he takes a hit and throws in the towel. Anthony says he's sorry he worried Rebecca and her mother. Misty says that the fighting brought a family back together. Giant then arrives to meet with Ash, though James's ill-timed appearance and response to Jesse causes them to realise it was Team Rocket in disguise. Jesse and James then try to recite their motto, although James, due to obvious strain from trying to carry Jesse on his shoulders, ends up collapsing beforehand. You should forfeit the match right now! Finish it! Hit Mon Lee! Mon Lee! Oh. Oh, are you all right? I'm fine. Don't worry about me. Oh, Daddy. Hmm. Are you hurt, Rebecca? No, I'm fine. I'm glad. <laughs> I give up. So shout out to Meowth's glue gun here. He's hiding under the ring to cause shenanigans. And he literally shoves a glue gun through a wrestling ring canvas to the other side and then sprays glue, which ends up um, messing up Hitmonchan's day. But how sharp does that glue gun have to be to pierce through a ring canvas? Like, that's going through wood for starters and a bunch of other things. Like, there's quite a lot going on in a, in a ring. And apparently Meowth has just got a glue gun that is basically doubling as a saw. It's, yeah, it's very impressive. Rebecca jumping into the ring is just so weird. It just plays out so weird. And that whole storyline is just so weird. It starts off with Rebecca wanting the gang to beat Anthony in the tournament. But then Team Rocket is actually the one that does this. And actually everything in that relationship turns around because Rebecca jumps in the ring and tries to stop the fight. So I don't know, it's just, it's introduced as if it's the most important thing in this episode. And then they resolve it in sort of a weird way. But also they resolve it with seven minutes left in the episode. So yeah, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, we started out with this, but it's kind of not important. It's gone now. We, we got that out of the way. The highly anticipated final battle kicks off between Ash's Prime Ape and the stolen Hitmonlee. Prime Ape blocks multiple rapid kicks from Hitmonlee and manages to sneak through a few hits. Under the arena, Meowth tries to pull off another cheating move, but Pikachu spots him and decides to get moving. He finds that Meowth has planted a bomb on the stage. So while the animation on the battles in this era is not great, they do have a lot of really cool still images. They actually... I'm sort of jumping ahead a bit there, but I guess, oh, I guess it's kind of a still image, but when Primeape ducks Hitmonlee's kick, it is a cool moment. And... I know they're sort of limited with their animation at the moment. They don't have the sort of quality of other anime at the time. And it's a bit, it seems a bit cheap. But there are cool moments like that, especially when they're not trying to like fully animate it. And they, I guess they lean into their limitations because some of the, just like, I guess like the paintings, the still paintings, good Lord, they are absolutely beautiful. Like 
those are images that I would love to get framed and put up on a wall. They're just gorgeous. Also, why does nobody at all question that all of a sudden Giant has changed into two different people? Previously, in all the other matches, Jesse and James had been dressed up as Giant, but now in the final, it's two different people. Like, it's just two random people. Why does nobody go like, what? Who are you? This is, you're not in the final. It's Giant that's in the final. Similarly, why does Hitmonlee just obey these trainers without question? None of this is making any sense. Like, it just if you think about it, it doesn't. It just falls to pieces. Meanwhile, back on the stage, Hitmonlee jumps up as per the plan. Meowth hits the button on the controls, but the bomb does not explode. Hitmonlee falls down, and Primeape grabs him. It uses its seismic toss and wins the match. Primeape has now become the P1 Grand Prix champion and proudly boasts its new championship belt. Ash says he's proud of Primeape. Anthony says it has a lot of natural talent and offers to train it for Ash. He promises that he'll make Primeape a true P1 champion. Meanwhile, Meowth and the rest of Team Rocket are baffled as to why the bomb didn't explode. Pikachu then turns up and gives the bomb to Meowth, who thanks Pikachu for finding it. Just at that moment, however, the bomb activates, shocking Team Rocket before exploding, sending them blasting off yet again. Congratulations! Primeape! Ash, this Primeape has got a lot of natural fighting talent. You think so? Mm -hmm. Why don't you let me train it for a while? I promise to turn it into a real P1 champion! And as I said just before, some of the still paintings are just so gorgeous. We get a great one of Primeape spiking him only with the seismic toss here. Which, I mean, again, it's a really great decision because their animation at the moment wouldn't be able to do that moment justice. But if they just cut out the animation and have it as a still image, I feel like it still works, it still gets the impact, and then you get an awesome, awesome visual on top of that. So I really don't mind them sort of leaning on this style because, I mean, it, it's gorgeous. It's so gorgeous to look at. Also, with Ash giving away Primeape, I have to say, I think people actually overrate Ash's Primeape. I mentioned in its debut episode that a lot of people on the internet sort of throw Primeape up as... Someone that would be on, like, Ashes, like, what is his top six, like, what's his, the strongest possible team you can build out of all the Pokemon Ash ever caught? And look, it is kind of strong, but if you look at its resume, it beats up a Machop, a Machamp, and then it beats a Pokemon being controlled by Team Rocket. So it's not exactly the greatest resume ever. So it's good, but I fail to see it as some sort of absolutely, like, ridiculously strong Pokemon. Ash leaves Primeape in Anthony's care for further training. His daughter says that she'll also make sure he spends some time at home. Primeape, now teary-eyed, waves goodbye to Ash and his friends as they continue towards Ash's next gym badge. There's no need to worry, you can depend on me. And I'll make sure my father spends lots of time with our family. Mm -hmm. You keep on training and winning, Primeape, and I'll always be grateful and proud that I knew a real P1 champion. <laughs> So as has been mentioned many times before, Anthony's offer to train Primeape makes no fucking sense. He offers to turn Primeape into a true P1 champion, but Primeape is already a true P1 champion, he just won the tournament. It makes absolutely no sense why he would leave Primeape with him, and I would really love to hear a writer explanation for this whole Primeape saga, because none of it makes sense from start to finish. Like, why did he catch it in the first place? Did he purely catch it just so you could have this P1 tournament? Like, I really, really wish there was more info surrounding sort of the writing decisions of this show. Also, unless I missed it, I don't think Ash actually says he'll come back for Primeape in the English dub. Like, I see it reported, but I watched the episode, and unless I missed it, I rewound the, I guess, like, the little finale, and I couldn't find Ash saying that he would come back for it. The closest they come is having the narrator say that maybe he'll reunite with it one day, but they're still, they qualify that with a maybe, like, they're very non-committal. So I was actually surprised at that. I thought, like, I thought that he was going to say that he'd come back for it, and I guess I remembered it as that. But yeah, I don't think that actually happened, but correct me if I'm wrong. 
And finally, Primeape wearing the belt looks extremely weird here, considering its body and its head are pretty much the exact same thing. So yeah, it's just very, very awkward that Primeape has to wear that belt. But that brings the episode to a close, which means it's time for my thoughts on the episode. I think this episode plays out kind of weird. It initially starts as the gang needing to help Rebecca get her dad back, and then it evolves into needing to stop Team Rocket and finishes off as a goodbye episode for Primeape. For an episode that's focused entirely around a fighting tournament, it does lack a lot of focus. Not exactly a bad episode, but it suffers massively for being so over the place. Topping it all off is just the fact that Ash leaving his primate with Anthony makes no sense whatsoever. I think my personal theory is that the writers realised they made primate too powerful and sort of needed to get rid of it to nerf Ash's power levels. Like, there was no way Ash could... Like, he would just be able to send out his primate in every gym battle and steamroll them the way they've sort of been building it up and I guess they want Ash to be someone who's like sort of stumbling through Kanto and Primeape sort of goes against that but then why make him catch it in the first place just it doesn't really make any sense. A few major events to recap here first off Ash's Primeape begins to obey him Primeape is revealed to know Scratch, Mega Kick and Seismic Toss. Ash wins the P1 Grand Prix with Primeape and then Ash leaves his Primeape with Anthony for training. Thank the Lord, we get an update to Ash Ketchum's win-loss record here. It's now at 6 wins and 5 losses. He has a positive win-loss record. He's also on a 3-win streak, surprisingly. I added both of Ash's wins in the tournament here to his uh, win-loss record. The second fight against Team Rocket is a little bit suspect, but he won and it's a proper fight, so it counts. I almost considered counting Pikachu being knocked out by Hitmonchan at the start of loss, but yeah, it's, nah, it's pretty iffy. So I kept it out, and with that, Ash he has more wins than losses, which is something that I'm not sure that's actually happened so far in the anime. This is definitely his longest win, win streak, I'd say. But it's now time to move on to our question of the episode, delivered to us via Pokemail. Now my question for this episode is pretty basic, I just want to know, what's your favourite Primeape memory? There's not a whole lot to choose from, you've got two whole episodes, but I'm sure some of you out there have a fond, fond connection to one particular thing Primeape did. So jump on over to the YouTube version of this episode and leave a comment below and yeah, I'll, I'll get back to you, I'll, I'll comment on whatever you think is your favourite, well whatever you say is your favourite Primeape memory. But now let's jump into our second episode of the week. Our second episode for today is the 28th episode of the Indigo League series titled Sparks Fly for Magnemite. In Japan, the episode was titled Do Coil Dream of Electric Mice? And oh my god, that is an amazing title. For those of you that don't understand it, the Japanese title is referencing the book Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? And the names of the two power plant workers are Dick and Philip which is a reference to the author of that book, Philip K. Dick. So, it's yeah, it's just, uh, it's just a, a brilliant title. I absolutely love it. And, yeah, shout out to whoever came up with that title in Japan. This episode aired on October 21, 1997 in Japan and on October 6, 1998 in the United States. This is the very first time in the English dub's history that it's been under a year behind the Japanese air dates. So, congratulations to the English dub. It started out ridiculously behind, but yeah, it's slowly pegging it back because it's able to air episodes five days a week. That goes up until about episode 43, I think, the syndication package ends. So there's going to be a lot of catching up until that happens. But then once syndication ends, there's a like a three or four month hiatus between it going to Kids WB. So it, the, the difference between air dates kind of balloons out again. On this day in Pokemon history for the Japanese air date, we've got a few things going on here. On this day in 1996, the very first deck of the TCG was released in Japan, which, that's a pretty big deal. That became absolutely massive worldwide. And honestly, there's a case to be made that at some point, the TCG was the most popular part. I don't know if it was like this everywhere, but America, it was definitely like that. And certainly in Australia, the Pokemon cards were ridiculously popular. It kind of felt like at different times, the games, the anime, and the TCG were the most sort of popular part. I would even argue that the games were probably the least popular part while I was growing up. 
because I don't, I just speaking anecdotally, but a lot of my friends didn't even have Game Boys. Like my best friend when I was in primary school at the time, he didn't have a Game Boy at all, but he was super into the anime. He had like VHSs of it and he was super into the TCG. We didn't even play the TCG. We just like collected the cards, but we loved it. He did have Pokemon Stadium 2 on his Nintendo 64, but like, yeah, he never, he never had a main series game, which... Yeah, it's really interesting to see how how Pokemon was able to succeed despite a lot of people not playing the games. Which I guess, like, it just goes to show that Nintendo and Game Freak and the Pokemon com- company, like, that multimedia marketing assault was just perfect. The fact that they put all th- three of those things out around the same time, just absolutely brilliant marketing and, it just, yeah, it just made everybody a Pokemon fan. In 1998, the Game Boy Color was released in Japan, which is a pretty big moment. The Game Boy Color was the very first handheld console that I had, so holds a special place in my heart. Lots of memories of playing through Pokemon Silver and Pokemon Crystal on that. And in 2005, Pokemon Emerald was released in Europe. On this day in Pokemon history for the American Air Date, in 2000, the Pokemon Pikachu 2 was released, which was a little like handheld virtual pet, if I'm correct, which is not something I ever had. And honestly, it doesn't look great, but I'm sure in 2000, people were absolutely eating that up. The IMDb rating for this episode is a 7.3. The screenplay was written by Junki Takagami. This is his sixth episode. Incredibly, this is actually his lowest rated episode so far, which is not bad, a 7.3 being your lowest rated episode, six episodes in. Yes, done, done pretty well. The director here is Koji Ogawa. This is his debut episode in the director's chair, and he's the 11th episode director the show has used so far. So, on debut here, let's see if he's able to stick a landing. As has been the case for a lot of episodes recently, there's no major human character debuts, but there are a lot of Pokemon debuts. We get the debut of Firo, Nidoran, Growlithe, Magnemite, Magneton, and Muck. The Who's That Pokemon for this episode is Magnemite, which is a little bit surprising. It's also a little bit surprising that... The episode title references Magnemite so heavily. When I'll touch on this later, but Magnemite really isn't like the most important part of the episode. It's sort of actually a minorish part of the episode. I would have really expected Muck to be the Who's That Pokemon. Upon arriving at the polluted industrial town of Gringy City, Ash, Misty and Brock notice that Pikachu has become faint and sparks are coming out of his cheeks. They subsequently rush to the Pokemon Center as they are watched by a shadowy Pokemon, as well as Meowth. Jesse and James begin to do their motto, though the stench forces them to stop. Meowth, who is inside his own contained device, gives them scuba suits to wear and says he will stay here to pump the oxygen and fresh air to them. He instructs them to dive into the water and swim through the pipes to the Pokemon Center, but they refuse. As a result, Meowth pushes a button that delivers Jesse and James an electric shock, and they reluctantly enter the sludge-filled sewer waters. This is a really weird city. Lots of factories, but no people. This place is called Gringy City. Gringy? Never heard of it. It used to be a lively, busy place with all these factories here. Yeah, they kind of went overboard with factories. Pollution ruined the air and the water here. I guess we won't find any Pokémon here. Pikachu, what's wrong? So not a whole lot to talk about straight up here, but I do really love the aesthetic of Gringy City. It's completely unique to anything we've seen in the anime up until this point. Basically, every city has been a huge metropolis. So seeing a city that's just lined with like warehouses and factories and it's completely polluted, it's essentially a city that's hit an economic slump because and like become des- deserted due to its pollution. And it's just I think it's really great for the world building. It's Nice to have, you know, that variety and not everything being this huge bustling metropolis. Also, the thing Meowth's inside of is literally just a flying saucer here. It's very, very strange. So at the Pokemon Center, Ash finds an uncharacteristically irritable Nurse Joy who dismisses Pikachu's condition as a cold. When Ash yells at her for not being very helpful, she explains that the sparks coming out of Pikachu's cheeks are an early symptom of a cold in electric rodent Pokemon. She suggests that they leave Pikachu there for the night and he'll be fine in the morning. Again, this is kind of becoming one of my regular segments on the show, Pokemon Center Watch, but obviously the Pokemon Center here has a unique design. This one looks like a bunch of crystals shooting up out of the roof, which is kind of cool, and I do love that they are continuing with this extravagant Pokemon Center design theme. 
Also, we get Ash bringing back the rubber gloves from episode one here. I just love this continuity. He pulls it out because, I mean, he can't touch Pikachu. Pikachu is just radiating electricity. So he's got to put the rubber gloves on. And it just, oh, I love it. I love it so much that they just pulled that back out again. I also want to know why all Nurse Joys are obsessed with telling people to go to bed. This is like the second, maybe even third Nurse Joy we've encountered where she's telling the characters to go the fuck to sleep. It's just, they really enjoy telling people to get to bed. I guess it would be annoying having people coming and going inside what is technically your house. Like, as like, far as I can tell, all the Joys just live inside the Pokemon Center. So I guess it would be annoying having people up at all times of the night. And I do love that they kind of make this joy sort of awful. It's like nice to get one of these characters that sort of has a unique personality. She's sort of shitty at her job. And like that's, again, like I said with Gringy City's setting, it's really refreshing to have that difference because all of the joys so far have basically been the same character. But this one here in Gringy City is like its own beast. It's a unique human person. And this is obviously the first episode to reveal that being electrically overcharged is dangerous for an electric type Pokemon. The episode Hoenn alone and its subsequent episodes actually expand on this condition and it's something they sort of go back to every now and then, which it's kind of cool that it's actually referencing like an early episode from the show. Like this is where what 30 episodes in and in Hoenn they decide to just like basically call back to this. At the same time, a large group of Grimer block the water flow into the hydroelectric power plant, causing the power to go out. This also stops the power supply to Team Rocket's scuba equipment and affects the Pokemon Center's intensive care unit, but Meowth manages to get Jesse and James back on the surface level. Ash, Misty and Brock decide to head for the power plant to try and do something. Pikachu cries out as they leave. They receive directions from Officer Jenny and Pikachu comes out of the nearby bushes. Misty realises that Pikachu was afraid that they wouldn't return for him later, so Ash decides to let him come along. Pikachu jumps into Ash's arms and receives a shock. The shadowy Pokemon watches from a nearby bush. Oh! What happened to these Pokemon? They're in intensive care. If we don't get the power back soon, well, I just don't want to think about what would happen. Don't just stand there! We have to save them! Joy, please do something! I don't know what to do. Hey, stop giving Joy a hard time. There's nothing that she can do. Let's go! <gasps> Pikachu! Pikachu, we'll be back when the power's back on! Good luck, everybody. So we get a moment where Meowth, when the power goes out, Meowth starts pondering about what Jesse and James would do if they run out of air. And the way he's holding his fingers, he's basically flipping off the camera, which, like, they linger on this shot for a while, which it gave me a good little chuckle, something that kids probably would have not even, like, they would have just glossed over it, but... To me, it'll just look like, oh, he's flipping me off right now for some reason. Got a few questions about this Pokemon Center. I guess they kind of play into this Nurse Joy being bad at her job. But how did they not have a backup generator at the Pokemon Center? It seems like a pretty stock standard and pretty important thing to have at a medical facility. Like, you're saying that your intensive care unit, all the Pokemon are just going to die if you have a blackout. It's just, it, that doesn't make sense. Similarly, how does Nurse Joy just let Pikachu wander off? She talks about how it needs to rest up and it needs to stay here, and they give Pikachu to Nurse Joy, and then Pikachu just wanders off literally immediately. Like, she, I, I know what happened. She went straight back to bed, did not give a single fuck about Pikachu, and Pikachu, yeah, was able to escape. Also, when Meowth gets them out of the sewer, Jesse and James, that is, why does he randomly wear a nurse outfit? Like, it serves no purpose. Like, he doesn't make a joke about nursing or any sort of thing like that so it just comes off as really weird and i'm probably going to assume that it actually makes sense in japan i hope it makes sense in japan because it certainly doesn't make sense in english so the group enters the power plant and notice that nobody's there to greet them misty locates a map and points out the direction to the central control room misty gets spooked as something flies behind her ash calls out misty's cowardice though soon after she and brock spot something behind ash he turns around though nobody is there the shadowy figure with a glowing blue eye appears behind Pikachu. Fearing the worst, Ash looks it up on the Pokedex and the mysterious creature is revealed to be Magnemite, the magnet Pokemon. Ash decides to catch it, but Magnemite only seems interested in Pikachu and begins to follow him. Ash yells at the Magnemite to cut it out and the Magnemite backs off. A nasty stench then enters the corridor. They turn around to see a grate falling off the ceiling, followed by several Grimer. Brock decides that it would be best not to say anything to insult their pride. Ash pretends to compliment their unique smell, but Misty says it stinks, and the leader of the Grimer, a Mark, rises from behind them. 
With a command from Muck, the Grimer attack, insulted by Misty's comment. Ash, Misty, Brock and Pikachu run. As they round the corner, they bump into two plant workers, Philip and Dick. The Grimer approach, and they all start running for the control room. They all hide in the control room, and Brock tries to bolt the door shut. One of the workers explains that the Grimer are clogging the C intake valve, preventing the power from coming back on. The Grimer throw themselves at the door, and soon bust it open. Pikachu uses its Thundershock attack to knock out some of the Grimer, but it isn't enough. Suddenly, the Magnemite knock out the control room ceiling grate, as several Magnemite and Magneton arrive. Their combined electric attack proves effective, and they manage to also scare off the Grimer, blocking the flow of water into the power plant, and the power is restored. It's no good! There are too many of them! What are they? Magnemite and their evolved form Magneton! They're friends of our stalker! So I'm really not sure why Ash is acting like Pikachu is his only choice of Pokemon here. He's acting like, oh, we're on the ropes and Pikachu can't really fight. But you have a bunch of other Pokemon. You've got your three Kanto starter Pokemon, and then you have your Pidgeot. So, or Pidgeotto. I always get mixed up between which is the second and third stage. It's a really basic thing that I should be able to get in 2020, but God, it kills me. But yeah, he has heaps of Pokemon to choose from. And he's like, oh no, I just have to use Pikachu, apparently. I did like the gag here of when they're running for their lives, but Brock still stops to sort of go on the classic um, introductory spiel that they give to every character of the day. It's really funny, and it's sort of, it feels like the writers are kind of taking the piss out of themselves with Brock doing that, and then they kind of shut him, shut him down because they're running for their lives. It's, a, it's actually a really great moment. What's not great is the fact that Philip and Dick are literally the most generic characters ever. Their designs are just so freaking bland. Nothing about them is memorable, memorable whatsoever. They literally look like the character you would start off in a video game when you're in the character creator. Like, when everything's set to default, that's what Philip and Dick are. I also couldn't find who voiced Philip and Dick, so if you know, drop a comment below in the YouTube video. Also, during this scene, Ash mentions that all the Pokemon at the Pokemon Center will die if the power doesn't come back on, and that just... The way he words it is just absolutely brutal. Despite fighting off the Grimer, the Muck leader still remains. Pikachu uses Thundershock, and Pikachu's obsessed Magnemite assists with a Thundershock of its own. The combined electric attack knocks the Muck unconscious, and Ash catches it in a Pokeball. To his discontent, he realizes that the smell of the Muck comes through the Pokeball. Later, Pikachu seems to be a lot better, and one of the power plant workers explains that when an electric mouse builds up too much electricity, its body becomes magnetized, and it seems as though it has a cold. Magnemite was apparently in love with Pikachu because he was magnetized, but now that Pikachu is better, Magnemite is no longer interested. All right, Pokeballs, go! What's wrong? <laughs> so we do have an error here. After the numerous Magnemite and Magneton clear the station of Grimer, Misty notices that there's still the muck left in the control room. Ash then says an adult muck and its child, but there's no other Grimer in the room. So it's it's really weird that he says that. There's no Grimer there. So yeah, I don't know why they added that in. It is important to note that the mention of Mark having a child was not in the Japanese version. So I have no idea why they they added that in especially because ash is catching that muck so are we led to believe that ash just separated it from its family it's just yeah not a great moment for um, four kids focusing on muck why in the hell did the writers have him get rid of primate only to have him catch a new pokemon the next episode it just as i said when discussing the last episode it just feels like this whole saga was just really poorly planned out i do have a bit of trivia on muck though Muck would not appear again until Ash had finished his quest to collect all the Kanto badges. Its next appearance is in Showdown at the Poke Corral. It appears just one more time in Kanto when Ash calls on it at the Pokemon League. It then appears three times in Orange Islands and twice in Johto. Since then, it basically appears twice per region. However, Kalos is the one exception. It doesn't show up at all in that region, so that's sort of the black sheep when it comes to Muck. Also, this is a pretty interesting fact. Despite the fact that it shows up, a whole bunch for a Kanto Pokemon, especially a Kanto Pokemon that isn't one of the really like beloved fan favorites. And despite it being used in quite a few important battles, 
Mark actually only knows two moves, which is the least of any of Ash's Pokemon. In the history of the show, it's only ever used Body Slam or Sludge Bomb. In the English dub of A Tense Situation, Muck actually is told to use Poison Gas. However, this isn't present in the Japanese version, so it doesn't really count. But even then, three moves across, what, like 20 years of the show? Pretty freaking bad. Suddenly, a Gyarados submarine comes out of the water with a large magnet attached to it. Team Rocket intends to use the magnet to capture Pikachu, unaware that Pikachu is no longer magnetized. When they activate the magnet, Magnemite and Magneton from all over town become stuck on it, and their combined weight causes the sub to sink. As Ash and the others prepare to leave Gringy City, they mention that the Grimer Horde was a sign that the town needed to be cleaned up, and suggested that if the residents clean up the air and the water, they will restore the city to its former glory. Taking the advice to heart, Nurse Joy and Officer Jenny bid farewell to them. All those Grimer here just prove that the ocean's totally polluted. You guys gotta clean up the sea around here. I know you can do it. You're right, Misty. We'll do everything we can to make sure that the ocean is really clean again. If you clean up the air and the water, you may just bring this place back to life. Thanks, Ash. You worked so hard to make sure all these Pokemon survived. You've inspired me to become a better nurse. We salute your fine work. Oh, please, ladies. That's very nice of you. Anyway, try to make your city clean. We will. And please come back and visit us. Bye. It is so, so strange that this episode basically is wrapped up but then Team Rocket makes a cameo in the last couple of minutes. So it's like, oh, the episode's not actually over. It's just, yeah, a really weird appearance. This appearance also marks the very first time Team Rocket's Gyarados submarine has been shown in the English dub, though, due to Beauty and the Beach being initially skipped. That actually introduced the Team Rocket sub, but obviously English-speaking audiences wouldn't see that until much later. So this is the debut for people outside of Japan. We also get to see in the shot of the gang talking to Nurse Joy and Officer Jenny there is a very, very small Raticate and a very, very small Fero, which is something, an issue that's sort of been cropping up recently with Pokemon sizes. To end the episode, we cut to Professor Oak's lab where a Pokeball arrives from Ash. As Professor Oak wonders what Ash caught this time, the Pokeball opens up and Professor Oak covers his nose in disgust as Muck appears. And again, much like the narrator giving Ash shit, Oak says as the Pokeball is arriving, it's been quite a while since Ash sent me a Pokemon, which it really hasn't been that long, you silly old fuck. It's been... <laughs> Like, I don't know how long has passed in the anime, but for us, it's been like a handful of episodes. So again, give him a break. Also, it doesn't really make sense why Ash is sending the Pokemon to Oak. I guess the reason is that it smells through the Pokeball, which is, thank God that is something that they dropped that it always smells. It's not even, it's really not even a funny gag. But Ash has open space on his team and he's just like sending away a Pokemon. It, when you look at it like that, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. But with the episode finishing, it's time for my thoughts on the episode. I think this is a pretty meh episode. I do like the setting of Gringy City, but a lot like the punchy Pokemon, which we reviewed earlier today, the episode really lacks focus. At first, it seems like the episode's going to be about the city being like too polluted or something. But then it seems like it's going to be about a race against time to save the Pokemon at the Pokemon Center. Then they introduce a random Magnemite love subplot. But then we pivot onto Ash catching a muck, and then it's not even done yet because we get Team Rocket, who we encounter for like five seconds to end the episode. I just think these past couple of episodes, the writers have been obsessed with jamming as much into the episode as possible, which I think is really hurting it. They just need to slow down and be more focused, because you could have definitely drawn great episodes from this and the punchy Pokemon. They had a good premises at heart, so yeah, it's annoying that they sort of just jam-packed it with everything possible instead of being focused and, you know, making sure the sole, per the sole focus of the episode is up to scratch. So we've got one major event here. Ash catches a muck, but sends it to Professor Oak's laboratory due to its nasty smell. There are no trainer battles here, so Ash Ketchum's win-loss record stays at six wins and five losses, still on a three-win streak. And now it's time for a second round of Pokemail. My question of the episode here for Sparks Fly for Magnemite is, do you like that Ash catches so many Pokemon in Kanto, or do you prefer the sort of the Alola method where he has a smaller team? Personally, I've always been in the smaller team camp. I hate when Ash just catches Pokemon for the sake of it and has like a bunch of Pokemon that get no character, no story, no personality, no development whatsoever. I love seeing his Pokemon grow and change and have actual characters. So 
when he does something like this in Kanto or in Unova, where he Unova is probably even uh, I don't know if it's worse, but it's pretty close the way that his Pokemon are developed. It just really sucks. I prefer to, but I prefer him having just a real close knit team. You can dedicate episodes to each one of them. It's just so much better. But I'm eager to hear what you guys think. Well, that's it for today's episode. Thanks for listening to Who's That Pokemon. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're not subscribed to the podcast, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, anywhere podcasts are served up. You can also find the show on Twitter at Who's That PKMN Pod to keep up with the latest updates for the show. And I'm on Twitter as at Source Marlow. You can also check out my YouTube channel, WTP Productions. There you're going to find all sorts of Pokemon content covering the games, anime, everything in between. I just recently had my Pokemon Yellow review go up, so check that out. And I've got a episode going up soon about the Pokemon Shock incident, the infamous Porygon, or Electric Soldier Porygon episode. I've got an episode that sort of talks about the entire history of that saga and sort of clears up a few myths surrounding it. But that's all for this episode. I hope you join me next time as I take a look back at Digdo's Diglett and the Ninja Pokey Showdown. For the first time in the English dub, Misty and Brock will get to meet Gary, while Ash will also be moving on to his sixth gym badge already. 